And with that, I guess we'll start uh, session 11 of QTML. So the first speaker is uh, by Juan Karasquia from the Vector Institute, and he'll, his talk is titled Simulating Quantum Systems with Probabilistic Models. So whenever you're ready, Juan, uh, please uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah. All right, so can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. Please. Okay. Good. So yeah, thank you uh, to the organizers for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak here. It's been a great um, conference and it's a great pleasure to be here. So thank you. So yeah, I'm going to tell you about simulating quantum systems using uh, probability. Um, this is work I've done with uh, like uh, for the last couple of years with my collaborators. And um, it is motivated by a paper that many of you know is this 1981 paper by Feynman, where he discusses, it's actually a keynote speech, where he discusses um, and motivation, uh, motivates the idea of uh, using uh, quantum physics to uh, simulate quantum physics, right? Which is simulating physics with uh, computers and where the idea of a quantum computer is, was first introduced or, or one of the first times it was first introduced. And basically this uh, paper motivated the, the shape, the, the, the field of quantum computation and quantum information, which is hoping to revolutionize uh, computation through exploitation of uh, quantum uh, mechanical effects. Uh, in that paper, there's a section, section five, where uh, Feynman asks the question, can quantum systems uh, be probabilistically simulated by a classical computer? Uh, which is very interesting, right? He has a very interesting discussion there. And, but as we probably, uh, as we all know, it's, the answer is no, we can't uh, do this in general. And uh, this is still true today, right? Like, and it's fundamentally linked to the notion of uh, quantum speed ups in, in quantum computing. So the conclusion is uh, no, there's, there's great difficulties because uh, either the quantum state or um, the description of the evolution of the quantum state is um, uh, kind of like plagued with uh, negative uh, probabilities uh, popping up all over the place. And that's uh, what prevents um, simulating uh, quantum physics with uh, probability. Uh, however, he discusses the notion of uh, pro simulating qu uh, quantum physics exactly, right? Like he doesn't discuss, uh, can you do it approximately, right? Like, and so that if you want motivates us to ask the question, can we do it approximately? Can we use probabilistic models or can we use probability to approximately simulate uh, quantum uh, systems? And so this is what we want to, to do, to explore. And um, I'm going to use uh, neural uh, probabilistic models to, to do this. And uh, uh, so I want to show you one example of uh, what this probabilistic models do uh, as a motivating example. So this is a text generation example. So um, this mo probabilistic models uh, can uh, simulator can model uh, conditional distributions. For instance, you can model conditional distribution of an output text given some input text. And so uh, people in machine learning have explored this problem and it's very popular right now in the uh, top in the uh, area of uh, research of um, uh, natural language uh, processing. And so here's one example. So you model uh, text or English text. Um, so given some input tests, can you produce some coherent text with what you had? And so what I did was I went to this website and then I typed quantum computers and then uh, that was the input. So that, that's very simple input. And then this uh, model is trained on the internet data and so on. And it produces a very coherent output over a page roughly, right? Like where this thing says, quantum computers with many trillions of qubits can solve certain types of uh, problems uh, much more efficiently than classical computers. They can also crack uh, public uh, key crypto systems because quantum computers can factor big numbers and, and many more, right? Like, so the, even uh, this model knows that uh, quantum computers are not real thing yet. Um, the earliest quantum computers might be 15 years uh, uh, into the future. And so it's a very interesting exercise as uh, models know too much in my opinion. So, but however, what I wanna highlight here is uh, they reproduce correctly the strong correlations present in, in the language, which are 
uh, I think known to be power law uh, correlated. So it's very interesting. Those techniques are very powerful and they're based on um, neural networks. They're called neural probabilistic language models. And so that's kind of like, uh, I'm always very impressed by these results. And uh, so you can do a lot of things. So one is this text completion, you can do question answering, summarization, you can do language translation. So if you go to uh, Google Translate, so what you're effectively doing is you're uh, using one of those probabilistic models um, where like you're conditioning on the language you know or with the language for the phrase that you know and you want to know the English translations and uh, this is what you're using, right? Like you're using a conditional distribution trained on a big bunch of um, translations for sentences. There's also language modeling, uh, which can be used for instance in speech recognition, um, and any other tasks. So, so this, uh, so this neural language models are, as I said, they're neural networks, and um, basically, a neural network, as most of you know, or we have seen throughout the week, are powerful universal function approximators that can, in principle, compute any function if you give them enough uh, trainable parameters. In some sense, so the what we've been asking for a uh, few years, even though I haven't motivated uh, as uh, best as I could, is uh, we can ask the question of whether with uh, whether these models can or cannot represent complex quantum states and um, use them, for instance, uh, for uh, say reconstruction quantum states like uh, we do in a tomographic uh, setting, or if whether we can do it for um, uh, simulating quantum enigmatic body systems. So, so that's kind of like uh, the brief uh, motivation for what I wanted um, to, to do and to uh, explore. And, um, and so let me tell you how we're gonna uh, do this or how we've been doing it uh, in, the, in the last few months is uh, first, we're, since we're gonna be using probability, so we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce a, a formulation of quantum theory that looks like probability. In a sense, this is kind of like, um, instead of uh, making the machine learning models uh, look more like quantum states, we're making uh, quantum theory more like, uh, um, more like machine learning in some sense. Now, once we have that uh, formulation, we can use uh, probabilistic models such as the, the generative models based on, uh, for instance, recurrent neural networks that we just explored in the previous talk or transformers to parameterize uh, quantum states. And, um, once uh, I motivate that, then I'm gonna give you a few examples. So one is related to uh, quantum state reconstruction, which is if you want an approximate version of uh, quantum state tomography um, using uh, neural nets, then I'm gonna show you uh, how to formulate um, uh, time dynamics or a unitary evolution in terms of uh, probability distributions. And finally, um, show you examples, numerical examples or exploratory examples of uh, using these models to uh, simulate quantum circuits and uh, open quantum system dynamics. So hopefully uh, I'm gonna get through, through all that. Um, so quantum states, measurements and probability distributions. So how are these related? So usually a uh, quantum state is traditionally described through a uh, density matrix, which describes the statistical uh, state of a system in quantum mechanics. Everything we can possibly know about a quantum system is encoded in such density matrix. Um, a quantum state is, uh, as I said, a matrix is described by, uh, this matrix is a positive semi-definite Hermitian trace one and acts on the Hilbert space. So for instance, for one qubit, all this, um, quantum states live in the so-called block sphere, right? Like, so that's very familiar um, to, um, to us. I'm representing this quantum state as a density matrix rho. And uh, this is a graphic notation by uh, Penrose uh, where uh, this uh, sticks represent the indices of the matrix over the different qubits, okay? So I'm gonna refer to some of these diagrams in, in what uh, comes next. Um, so, but I, I was wondering like uh, if we can represent quantum states with probability and there's a way, it's a very simple way, uh, is through measurements. And there's measurements, uh, it's not because uh, just one measurement is because uh, this is what you do in an experiment. When you go to an experiment in the lab, you create some quantum state row, you can apply some measurements. And these measurements are described by a set of uh, operators that I call called uh, M, uh, they're called positive operator value measures in the most uh, generic uh, setting. And uh, they satisfy some uh, constraints, right? Like, so you have a, a set of measurements MA, um, 
if you sum over all of them, they're positive semi-definite. And um, uh, if you, sorry, if you sum over them, uh, over the set of uh, P of M elements, you get the identity operator. Um, and then the other important thing is uh, Born rule, which connects uh, quantum theory to the experimental results of a measurement. So if you prepare a quantum state row and you apply measurement M, then you're gonna see outcome A with some probability, okay? And uh, in this case, this probability is given by the Born rule. So it connects experiments with quantum theory. It's a very important uh, uh, rule in, uh, in everything we do. Um, and uh, the type of measurements that I'm gonna use in particular are, are called informationally complete. And uh, what that means is that uh, if you measure or if you uh, have this measurement statistics uh, of uh, such a measurement, you know all the information about the quantum state role. Okay, so that's one interpretation of uh, informational completeness. The other uh, thing or the other uh, aspect of it is that if you um, have a relation between, so if you have information and completeness, it means that this born rule can be inverted, right? Like, so in here, we go from the state to the probabilities. If you measure uh, an information and complete uh, POVM, then uh, you can express rho in terms of the probability distribution P. Um, the other uh, aspect is, uh, uh, or like John, the other um, characterization of information and completeness is that M forms a complete basis for operators in a, a Hilbert space. And the way we construct uh, the measurements is motivated by experiments. Right now in the experiments in quantum computers and in trapped ions, uh, we can measure, we can have access to uh, uh, single qubit um, rotations or measurements. So we construct um, our POVMs based on what's available in experiment, which is uh, single qubit POVMs or tensor products of uh, um, uh, POVMs, which I represent here in this uh, ten tensor network uh, notation. Uh, so as I said, so information and completeness means that you can go from uh, the raw to the statistics PA or vice versa. And by that, but I mean, we can express raw in terms of the probability distribution P uh, and some tensors, okay? So this is the relation. It's, uh, uh, it's very simple. It's a linear relation, Born rule is linear. So you just take the inverse of it when you can. And, um, uh, and then this is what you get for the density matrix. So this is your uh, density matrix row equals to uh, some probability distribution contracted with a set of uh, simple tensors. So this can be seen as a factorization of the quantum state in terms of uh, positive part, which is the probability uh, times some uh, simple tensor product of uh, single qubit uh, operators. Okay, so that's um, how we think about this uh, factorization. Uh, it's also in the line of uh, the, this idea of positivization where you factorize the quantum state in terms of a positive part and, um, uh, and, a, neg and a complex uh, valued part. And, um, so what we're doing effectively is we're going from a representation in terms of density matrix in the block body in higher dimensions. So this is not a sphere. So this is a schematic representation in uh, high dimensions. We cannot picture it. Um, in, uh, and then we're going uh, and moving all that information about the quantum state into a uh, probability distribution or in a simplex, where is, which is the geometric uh, structure where probability distributions live, okay? Um, so that happens through one rule. You can go from uh, one to the other and vice versa through these two uh, relations. And uh, uh, for instance, time evolution, uh, which is when you apply, say, some um, Hamiltonian dynamics to your system, you start from some initial state row zero, and then as a function of time, it just uh, travels in uh, in block sphere, translates into uh, probabilities like time evolution of probability distribution. So you start from some distribution p zero, p one, all the way to p three, which corresponds to this uh, state row three. So no, so one thing I would like to emphasize here is that this uh, probabilistic simplicity is too big. It's actually too general. It's more general than quantum mechanics, and uh, in that not every probability distribution corresponds to a valid quantum state, okay? And so uh, there's a region in, in the simplex that people call Qplex as uh, everything quantum, we add a Q. So you add the Q to the word simplex and that's the Qplex. This is not my, um, uh, not my invention, but uh, this is, uh, it comes from the quantum Bayesian, quantum Bayesian theorists. And so uh, that's, if you want, um, 
one thing I'd like to highlight. So uh, some distributions do not correspond to quantum states and we have to be careful about uh, this when we do numerics and when we do quantum state reconstructions. So that's the picture. Uh, so can we use this um, to do, uh, uh, can, we make, can we make this representation with machine learning? That's the, that's the, the question. And the insight that we had was, yes, we can, uh, model this distribution of out measurement outcomes with uh, machine learning. So for instance, you can uh, take this distribution and impose some model. For instance, you can use uh, RNNs like in the previous talk or a transformer or uh, you name it, right? Like, and so we pick this uh, autoregressive models because they have special uh, properties. You, they allow for uh, exact sampling. So you don't, you don't have to rely on Markov chains to obtain uh, samples, samples from, this, uh, from this distribution. And they also have a tractable density, meaning that you can compute P model um, for any given measurement computation. And so by doing that, we have a model uh, for our density matrix, uh, which is constructed by a, a probabilistic uh, model and some tensors that we know. Um, they're very simple and they're single qubit ones, so we can uh, compute them exactly. And so can we use this in practice? And the first example we have is, uh, can we learn quantum states from measurements? So can we do uh, approximate quantum state tomography using this uh, idea or using these probabilistic models? And that's the first example we consider. Uh, why did we do this? Because we need to go beyond uh, standard quantum state tomography because it basically scales exponentially in general. And um, we've seen impressive uh, developments in, in say in experiments with cold atoms, trapped ions, and uh, superconducting qubits that are well beyond what you can do with exact tomography. So we wanted to explore how we can go beyond uh, quantum state tomography by using this model. So in quantum state tomography, what you do is you prepare an unknown quantum state, you apply a measurement that probes enough information about the quantum state and you repeat. So you collect the statistics of these measurements, you infer a reconstruction of the state by doing that, right? Like, so we fit a probabilistic model to the outcomes of the, uh, the experiment. So that's how it, it works in principle. And uh, so that's what we did in principle. Uh, we started with a very simple uh, set of states and this is from simulated uh, data. So we, we took uh, uh, say ground states of uh, many body Hamiltonians. We uh, numerically imagine applying these measurements and then we collected data and see if uh, this idea works in principle, right? Like, so that's what we did. And so here's uh, two examples of uh, doing this type of reconstructions for uh, the ground state of the transfilizing model in 1D, which is the Hamiltonian here for 50 spins, which already goes beyond what you can do with uh, quantum state tomography, with exact quantum state tomography. And this probability distribution PA, we model uh, using a recurrent neural network um, with uh, three uh, layers, uh, gated recurrent unique layers. Uh, and then what we did was we took all this data and see if we could get the correlation functions of the of the model that reproduced this model. And what we see is that uh, in uh, red, we have the synthetic data the expectation value of uh, sigma x allow as a function of uh, sites in the system and we get a uh, decent uh, reconstruction, right? Like it's just this uh, green uh, dots here, which reproduce pretty well the correlation functions of the simulated state. This again, we reproduce uh, the two body correlations um, um, properly or accurately. Then we went ahead and we did a little bit of a more complicated state. So it's the ground state of the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice. So this model has a um, complicated ground state with a sign structure that is very intricate. We don't know what it is, but uh, we can compute approximations to it using uh, two-dimensional density matrix renormalization group, which is what we did to produce this simulated uh, data. And then what you have here is the two body correlations for the synthetic state and then the reconstruction uh, state is this one here uh, for which we've used again, the same RNN that we used uh, previously. Uh, so this is the architecture we use is a recurrent neural network um, where we stack uh, three layers of, um, of this gated recurrent units. Mm -hmm. 
So let me go ahead and mention that uh, RNNs work okay, they do the job, but can we do better, right? Like, and it turns out that uh, the so-called transformer architecture is significantly better at, uh, at reconstructing these quantum states. And I encourage you to check uh, Peter Chas' talk at four in the conference uh, for a demonstration that the transformer is much better, but also for an experimental demonstration of the technique, which we recently posted on the archive with, um, with our collaborators at uh, uh, Cornell. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight, this is very exciting for me, is that there's a neuromorphic implementation of the reconstruction scheme using this POVMs by uh, Stephanie Chischek, which was uh, one of our chairs in the morning. So I encourage you to take a look at this uh, exciting paper where they reconstruct bell states using neuromorphic uh, um, chips and they observe indeed um, bell violation. So it's a very exciting uh, piece of work. So I encourage you to take a look at uh, at this. Um, but then, okay, so this is uh, reconstructing um, quantum states from data that you produce, say, experimentally or numerically. But uh, but I wanted to explore this a little bit uh, more, like want to go beyond uh, what, uh, like uh, recon data reconstruction and see if we can um, do simulations, right? Like, can we use these models to simulate, say, for instance, the Schrodinger equation, uh, real-time dynamics, and so on. Uh, so, let, so let me first tell you how unitary evolution looks like in, in terms of probability in this probabilistic language. So in the usual language, what you do is you take an, an initial distribution, uh, sorry, quantum state raw, and then you unitarily rotate it, right? Like you end up with this um, new density matrix raw U uh, through some unitary matrix. So when you transform uh, that uh, expression into the um, language of probability, what you get is uh, basically you go from an initial distribution P uh, times some matrix O and you get this distribution P U. Um, it turns out this matrix O is obviously related to the unitary, but it has some interesting properties. So I call them probabilistic gates as if this uh, was a unitary gate, then this, I call this a probabilistic gate. They're rep, um, described by uh, so-called somewhat or quasi-stochastic matrices. They're also unitary uh, and they look almost like a stochastic matrix in that if you sum over the columns, you get the uh, you get one, but they can be positive or negative. So you don't get rid of uh, sign problems and, um, and signs when you're trying to do time evolution using this, um, this quantities. Um, everything else, and quantum theory follows like sharing your equation, measurements, uh, channels, and Lindblad equations. So you can um, uh, reproduce everything in quantum physics in this language. Um, the question is, can we simulate this, uh, this evolution, unitary evolution or evolution general? This is more general than unitary. So this equation gives you uh, time evolution, even if, the, if your system is subject to dissipation, for instance. So uh, can we do it with probabilistic models? And the answer is we can try. Uh, we can try to fit a model to the unitary evolved uh, distribution PU. And that's what we did, or the first attempt at doing this is we introduced a model P theta that is gonna be feeding uh, PU, uh, even though we don't know what it is, right? Like, and so how we did it was we computed divergence between the model uh, P theta and this time of all distribution PU, even though we don't have access to it. And what, to do this, uh, we just basically introduced this uh, Kullback library divergence um, and then replace uh, PU by this expression. And then uh, we separate this uh, KL divergence in terms of um, quantity, it's a called cross entropy that is easy to evaluate and that does not depend on PU. And then some uh, entropy of the uh, PU that is independent of the parameters. And then what we do is we try to uh, minimize this um, KL divergence with respect to the parameters in the model. Turns out this is uh, doable by just basically taking samples from the original distribution P and, uh, and the model um, P theta and, and the matrix that you're trying to uh, apply. Uh, and so with that tool on our uh, belt, what we did was we tried uh, some proof of principle calculations, okay? So can we do unitary evolution uh, in, in terms of probabilistic models? So let me show you what this uh, proof of principle looks like. So what we did was we, um, we, uh, we tried to pre uh, like simulate very simple circuits to create the belt state and the graph state. And so here, what you see is the KL divergence between the, uh, the model uh, 
uh, p theta and the exact distribution pi as we apply different gates. So, and the good news here is that um, when we do the training of this uh, cost function or a similar cost function, what uh, we see is that the uh, scale divergence goes very rapidly to a uh, very small number, basically exponentially. This is a log log uh, as a log plot, and um, and so uh, however we accumulate some errors, so we make some errors because we cannot get uh, this uh, cost function to go to exactly zero. However, it goes to very small numbers, so we're we're confident this is work this is working. Then we do um, we apply a second gate, say for instance for the generation of the bell state. Then we apply a control x gate. And then again, uh, the cost function goes exponentially uh, to very small numbers, but then it saturates at some uh, value that um, um, that is, if you are non-negligible sometimes. Uh, the same is uh, what you see in the other plots is the, the same observation, things going exponentially fast to very small numbers and accumulation of uh, a little bit of error as you apply the second gate and so on. So pretty much in the same way that a quantum computer works, right? Like you apply gates which make errors and the, these errors start to accumulate. Um, and so that's, um, um, that's how it works. However, as you increase the power of the model, the, there's a tendency for those uh, calculations to improve, which is also good news. Um, this is uh, uh, on uh, the second um, uh, row, we see calculation of uh, graph state. It's only two qubits where you apply only this control uh, Z gate. And you, what we see is again, it goes exponentially fast to uh, small numbers um, and uh, some accumulation of error at the end. And the simulations are based on a transformer. Um, this is, uh, these observations are in this uh, paper from uh, last year that we haven't been able to publish. Been rejected, I think, three times already. Um, so that's for two qubits. Then we tried um, off up to 60 qubits, trying to produce again this uh, G generalized GHZ uh, state on up, uh, systems up to 60 qubits. Uh, this is a quantity called quantum uh, classical fidelity, which is a weaker uh, measurement of fidelity than the through uh, quantum fidelity, but uh, that's one that we can compute, at least for the simple uh, quantum states. And what we see is that uh, as we grow the size of the systems, um, the fidelity drops. But as we make the model more powerful, the fidelity has a tendency to improve. So there's hope that uh, we can improve this um, either by defining a different cost function or by defining um, a better training strategy or a better model that, that we are hoping to be able to simulate more complicated quantum systems. Um, Finally, in the last uh, two minutes, uh, I, I wanted to discuss quickly real-time dynamics. So if you want, what we've done so far is this uh, discrete time dynamics. Now we can do continuous uh, real-time dynamics. And for that, we wrote the Limblad equation in terms of this uh, probability distributions. So you go from this equation, uh, use Born rule, and you get this uh, differential equation, high dimensional differential equation uh, in probability where uh, A, this A tensor, or this A matrix is uh, responsible for the unitary part, the Hamiltonian part. And this part is uh, responsible, uh, B is responsible for the dissipative part. And, um, and then we ask the question, can we uh, fit models to time evolution of this distribution? Uh, we use the trapezoidal rule. Uh, so in principle, you can basically can take what, any uh, equ differential equation solver and apply it, except that um, uh, this uh, y uh, quantities are, are extremely big. There are exponentially many of them. So you cannot do this uh, trapezoidal rule exactly on an exponential uh, space. So we have to come up with uh, ways to enforce this approximately, right? Like, so what we did was we wrote, we rewrote the trapezoidal rule um, for each component. So this is exponential, uh, a number of questions that is exponential. Uh, but then what we did was we, we sum over all of them, subtract uh, the two pieces in the equation, and then um, take the absolute value to define a cost function. And then we sample these distributions um, and estimate some cost function C. Uh, this comes 
cost function C is optimized uh, such that if you get it to go to zero, then you implement the trapezoidal rule uh, exactly, okay? And then uh, you try this uh, as a function of time, many uh, iteratively, and you hope, you pray that uh, this distribution catches the dynamics of the system. Um, you can also do the fixed point dynamics. So when you have the dissipative dynamics, you there's a, a point in time where like the dissipation balances unitary dynamics and you get to a point where the system uh, does not evolve in time anymore. And then we did the same, right? We defined a cost function that we can compute such that if we uh, manage to optimize it to zero, then we, uh, have, we were able to find this uh, distribution exactly. So we can compute fixed points of uh, dissipative dynamics. We took a look at the Heisenberg model in one and 2D. We did uh, quenches in the presence of dissipation and we track the evolution of expectation value of uh, simple operators um, and compare with the uh, exact numbers um, when available. And then we went up to say quenches uh, with up to 40 spins. Um, as a function of time, we went up to time equals to three. Uh, this is in 1D for uh, 16, um, uh, sorry, for up to 40 spins. And this is in 2D uh, with a three by three uh, system. And we see good agreement with, um, with the uh, numerics, with the exact numerics when available. For instance, in 2D on a nine, uh, three by three, you get basically uh, perfect or very good agreement with the uh, exact um, simulation using Q-tip, uh, which is this very nice software to do simulation of open quantum dynamics. This is for the steady state. Um, um, so basically we took a 16 qubit uh, system, uh, transitorializing model, and we would do a quench. And we wanted to compute the steady state simulation. So basically the long time dynamics, the raw dot equals to zero uh, state, the density matrix that satisfies rho is equal to zero. Um, and then we uh, compute expectation value of sigma x, sigma y, uh, sigma z as a function of um, g in the, uh, the transverse field, basically. Um, uh, and what we saw uh, is that uh, we're, we're able to reproduce basically the exact numbers uh, pretty accurately. Um, and uh, we also compare with a technique based on a restricted Boltzmann machine from uh, Filippo Vicentini. Uh, published in PRL, and what we saw is that, I mean, they also have good agreement, but uh, they deviate more um, in the challenging, uh, in the challenging cases, right, like near uh, G, uh, uh, transit field divided by the dissipation uh, around two, we get much better results. And uh, so we think this approach is, uh, it looks uh, promising. And uh, we recently posted the paper on the archive as well. Um, so let me conclude. So can quantum systems be probabilistically simulated um, uh, with pro uh, using a classical computer? Well, the answer is still no, because we're not doing an exact simulation. Uh, we did add a formulation though, that allows to, if you want to massage quantum theory in such a way that it looks more like uh, machine learning. And uh, we're, by using this powerful models like the transformers or the RNNs, we're able to uh, approximate uh, say proof of principle uh, systems or prototypical systems in, in condensed matter uh, relatively accurately. The good news is this optimizations are easy. They're relatively uh, easy, even though they require some tricks like uh, variance reduction uh, um, techniques and uh, sampling tricks and so on. There's lots of other things we can do, like we can explore different architectures. Uh, and I have the example of the neuromorphic as one I didn't anticipate, but uh, that works really well. Um, other machine learning models, different, uh, more suitable objective functions. These were all heuristics we came up with, but there may be better ones. Uh, we can try to implement symmetries, different uh, systems and so on. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, thank uh, the organizers and everybody for attending. All right, thanks Juan for a great talk. Um, so looking at the Q&A channel, there seem to be two questions. So first question by Vladimir, uh, why do RNNs allow for exact sampling? 
Oh yeah, this is a good question. So uh, they allow for exact sampling because uh, what you do in an RNN is you split the probability uh, distribution of uh, say n variables a1, a2, a3, a through a n in terms of the conditionals of uh, uh, so p uh, of uh, those is equal to p of a1 times p of a2 condition on a1 uh, p of a3 condition on a1 and a2 and so on and so what you do is you parameterize each of these uh, conditionals and so um, you can use that rule so you first sample p of a1 you get a sample then you feed it to the model you sample uh, a2 um, and so on you keep doing this and this uh, allows you i mean this the fact that you structure the model in this way allows you to get uh, exact samples in um, uh, in that way and uh, that it's just because of the way you structure the model. Thank you. And one more question by Vladimir again. Uh, could you please explain a little bit more why you don't need to use PU when modeling dynamics and how is the sampling done? Yeah, so, um, so that's a good question again. So, this, so what we do is we compute um, so we compute this uh, cross entropy basically, right? Like which is, uh, it has PU uh, and the logarithm of uh, P theta of the model. But PU, we, we just basically replace with, uh, with the uh, expression here, PA uh, and the matrix O. And then um, what we do is we sample from the uh, distribution PA. So you, uh, by doing that, then you can compute uh, an approximation to this uh, cross entropy that doesn't involve uh, PU directly. So it's because you can, or we assume that we can sample P, that uh, you don't need the distribution PU. Okay, thanks so much again, Juan, for a great talk. Um, and now for the next talk, we'll have Piotr Sarnik from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And his talk is titled, Air Mitigation with Clifford Quantum Circuit Data. And so whenever you're ready, Peter. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. And so I'll try to share my screen. Uh, is it OK? Yes, looks great. Uh, so thank you for giving me opportunity to uh, present um, our research. Um, I'm going to talk about an error mitigation method um, which we developed uh, together in Los Alamos. Um, I was working on that with Andrew R. Smith, Patrick Coles, and Lukasz Cincio. We already uh, heard about error mitigation methods during this conference. So just to uh, give you a very brief reminder about what uh, the error mitigation is. Obviously, our quantum devices are affected by noise. And uh, in the case of um, devices which we expect to have in the near future, we do not expect uh, to be able to perform full uh, quantum error correction as uh, the error rates are too large for that. Therefore, we um, resort to methods which just reduce eff effects of the noise without performing uh, the full correction. Such methods are called error mitigation methods. Uh, there are many such methods already proposed. We've heard about some of them during this conference, but anyway, um, performing error mitigation for large deep circuits, uh, which are necessary for quantum advantage is a challenge. So we are exploring um, here a new method and hope that it may help us in that goal. Uh, the method is uh, called uh, Clifford data regression or CDR. Uh, before I will uh, go into this uh, Clifford part, I'll uh, briefly sketch the idea of the method. So maybe let's start with our task, which we actually share with most of the error mitigation methods. So we have some quantum circuit of interest. This particular circuit might be, uh, might be a uh, it might be impossible to simulate it classically. We have some observable of interest and we have a noisy quantum device, which gives us the noisy expectation value. We would like to estimate the exact one based on that. So the first um, step of our method, as you can see uh, in this um, cartoon, 
is to generate the training data. The training data are just um, a set of the noisy and the exact expectation values for our particular observable of interest. And they are obtained for uh, circuits which can be simulated classically. So these are these different circuits than the one which uh, you would like to correct at the end of the day. But we still hope uh, that um, we are able to choose these circuits in such a way that we can uh, learn something about noise effects for our circuit of interest. When we have this um, training set, we learn a model which uh, characterizes relationship between uh, exact and the noisy value of our observable of interest. And later we use this model to predict uh, the, the expectation value of interest for our circuit of interest. To go uh, into more detail, so the first element about which I would like to uh, speak is the actual choice of this uh, training data or um, circuits which we use to construct this training data. So we use um, circuits which are com composed mo mostly of uh, Clifford gates. Clifford gates are just gates which um, map poly operators into poly operators, but uh, they are, uh, we are interested in them because such circuits can be simulated classically. Furthermore, it turns out that uh, when we have a circuit built uh, out of Clifford gates and some small number of non-Clifford gates, we can also simulate it classically. It turns out that right now with current um, simulators, we are able to simulate um, circuits which have uh, at most about 50 non-Clifford gates. Therefore, we construct our training um, set using such circuits. And uh, we actually treat the number of non-Clifford gates in these circuits as a refinement parameter of our method, as we uh, expect that um, the more non-Clifford gates um, in our in circuits in our training set, more closer we are able to get to um, our circuit of interest. So to, to be a little bit uh, more specific, uh, let me give an example. So at the uh, left uh, hand, we have an exemplary circuit which we would like to correct. Uh, the circuit was uh, compiled for an IBM Q for an IBM quantum device. It's built from three different uh, type of types of gates. Um, first, there are elementary pulses uh, denoted here by P. There are also rotations around Z axis parametrized by different angles. There is one C naught. It turns out that the elementary pulses and the C naught are Clifford gates, but um, the uh, rotations are not. At least in this particular example. Uh, so to construct um, an exemplary training circuit, we may want to replace some of these rotations by gates which are actually Clifford. It turns out that, for example, rotation which is parameterized by an angle pi divided by two is a Clifford gate. So in this particular example, I just replace two of the rotations by uh, this uh, phase gate S and also one gate by the identity gate, which is also a Clifford gate. Uh, at the end of the day, I have a circuit which is composed mostly of Cliffords. And um, this circuit still resembles and structure the original circuit. So I hope that I'm able to, I will be able to learn something about noise from such a circuit. The second technical element <clears throat> about which I would like to uh, talk is um, the actual answer that we use to learn the relationship in between noisy and uh, exact data in our training set. So use a very simple ansatz, which, um, uh, which uh, 
it's just a linear answer that tells you that um, we hope to learn uh, the exact data, the exact expectation value by just rescaling and shifting the noise expectation value. We have these two parameters, A1 and A2, which uh, describe these parts of the, um, of the transformation. The motivation for such a simple answer is that first there's an empirical motivation frequently we see in the case of real data obtained by obtained from quantum devices that just by scaling and shifting we can uh, mitigate a lot of noise effects second motivation is that if we consider global depolarizing noise such simple uh, noise model is good enough to completely correct noise effects uh, to uh, to convince you hopefully that this method can give us a good uh, improvement of our noisy results. I will show you benchmark results. First, um, the first benchmark which we performed was um, simulations of uh, ground states of transverse 1D quantum easing model. This model is a paradigmatic model of uh, condensed matter physics. It is also well known that its ground state can be uh, simulated with good, with good accuracy by quantum alternative operator ANSATS QAOA, about which we've heard already a lot during this conference. Uh, I don't have uh, time to go into details of this ANSATS. It was already introduced, I think, during, during this conference. Just um, let me uh, tell you that we will be interested in uh, the problem for different, for many different uh, values of the number of qubit, qubits, uh, which we denote by Q. We, and we will be also interested in ANSATS with um, different number of layers, which we denote by P. So we optimized our QAOA using a um, noise model obtained by gate set tomography of IBM's Urensa quantum computer. You can uh, find details of this noise model in this uh, paper. Later, we took a uh, set obtained local minima of the optimization and simulated them, or more precisely, we simulated their energy using a real device, IBM's Almaden quantum computer. We also used the real device to correct the obtained noisy energies. So here you can see results for four different uh, local minima of the optimization. Here we had a problem uh, of ground state simulation of 16 qubit Ising model, and we had two layers of the QAA ansatz, which means that we had in this particular ansatz eight layers of CNOTs. And we obtained, in all cases, an order of magnitude improvement of the uh, corrected energy. In the left panel, you can see the relative error. And in the right panel, you can see the actual energies, noisy, exact, and the corrected ones. Uh, to better understand the uh, performance of the method, we analyzed also scaling of the, uh, of the error, of the corrected error as a function of different parameters. So uh, here, uh, just to obtain scaling for many different parameters, we perform uh, the actual simulation of the minima and the correction using our noise model. First, we look into the case of um, 32 qubits and two layers, and we, um, and we investigate how the performance of our correction method scales with number of non-Clifford gates and in, our, in circuits in our training set. Uh, well, I already told you that we expect that the larger number of non-Clifford gates left in our training circuits, we expect better accuracy. It turns out to be the case in this particular benchmark. In panels B and C, we analyze accuracy of the correction as the function of both in panel, in panel B, uh, depth of the ansatz and in panel C as a function of the number of the qubits 
As expected, the problem becomes more difficult to correct with increasing depth of the circuit and, and with increasing number of the qubits. But still, uh, you can see that even for 16 qubits and four layers of the ansatz, we are able to obtain an order of magnitude improvement for the relative energy error. And also in the case of 64 qubits and two layers of the ansatz, we are able to obtain an order of magnitude improvement. Furthermore, I think it's worth to know that in the case of the scanning with number of qubits, the scanning looks uh, not that bad. I mean, it, it seems that um, the accuracy is decaying rather polynomially than exponentially with um, number of qubits, the limit of large number of qubits. And uh, I would like to emphasize also that um, while we are quite happy with the large correction for 64 qubits as, uh, as for more difficult problems, one can expect quantum advantage for 64 qubit uh, problems. That was just um, one benchmark, which was, um, which was related to variational optimization of parametrized quantum circuits. We did also a second benchmark um, just to see um, how our method will perform for very different task. It was the task of quantum phase estimation. So actually we analyzed um, outputs of, um, of an algorithm for quantum phase estimation, which was proposed by Rolando Soma. Th this is an algorithm which um, is um, designed to be friendly for near-term quantum devices as it requires single ancilla qubit. The algorithm boils down to evaluation of the expectation value of the um, evolution operator for some series of times for a given Hamiltonian and for a given input state. And then classical post-processing is performed using these expectation val values of the evolution operator. This is still quite challenging algorithm for NISC devices as it requires one to perform controlled uh, exponent gate, which translates after compilation to a uh, quite deep circuit. Because of the uh, depth of the circuit uh, required, we just looked into a simple uh, problem, a three qubit Hamiltonian to perform a benchmark, um, we consider random input states. Uh, there were product states. And um, well done, uh, we can, using the algorithm, we can decompose uh, our input states into binned gambases of our Hamiltonian. We can perform this decomposition using just the noisy expectation values, or we can correct the expectation values and perform the decomposition using the corrected expectation values, and then compare with the exact expectation values. So uh, in the uh, top panel, you can see uh, results of such, uh, of performing such decomposition in these uh, three cases. That's exact, that's, um, actual case, which was the most difficult to uh, correct with our method. But still you can see that um, the blue corrected curve is much closer to the uh, black exact curve than the one obtained using the noise expectation values. It turns out that uh, when you uh, look at the uh, error of the decomposition, even in this most challenging case, among 20 random instances, we obtain uh, a factor of free improvement. Here to perform uh, the here to perform the computation we used, again, the, um, the noise model of IBM's Urense quantum computer. Uh, to conclude, uh, we proposed a ramification methods, which at least in the case of 64 qubit um, QAOI um, ground state 
energy simulation problem produces or gives us an order of magnitude improvement. This method learns uh, effects of the noise using uh, a training set built of um, nearly four circuits. We think that um, there's potential for further improvement of, of the method with um, more powerful ansatzes to capture the noise uh, effects. And I um, think there's also potential to generalize this method by, for example, taking into account more features into um, during construction of the training set. Actually, uh, very recently, we uh, published um, a method which actually generalizes for delta regression. And um, one can say that attempts to unify it with another very successful error mitigation method, zero noise extrapolation. The method is called variable noise Clifford data regression. Uh, the method was uh, proposed as a result of summer school project, in collaboration with our summer students, Angus Lauer, Max Hunter Gordon, and again with Andrea Smith, Patrick Coles, and Lukasz Cincio. And I was also working on this method. I do not have time to go into the test. I just like to hi highlight some properties of this method. One uh, property of the method is uh, which um, makes it an attempt to generalize both zero noise extrapolation and for data regression is that when we construct our training set, uh, we um, have in our training set circuits with different noise levels. In that um, respect, the method resembles zero noise extrapolation as zero noise extrapolations also looks into, um, into um, circuits with different noise levels. Furthermore, when we have our final ansatz, which we use to correct uh, the noise expectation values, the ansatz is again inspired by zero noise extrapolation. Uh, just to um, give you one uh, result from this paper, it turns out that um, consistently the new method outperforms both Clifford data regression and zero noise extrapolation and all numerical benchmarks which we performed. In particular, we were looking at random quantum circuits with up to 64 qubits. And in that case, we, we found that for 64 qubits, the new method outperforms zero noise extrapolation by a factor of 2.7 and Clifford data regression by a factor of 1.5. So we are pretty excited about this new method. Uh, with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, thanks so much, Peter, for a great talk. Um, I don't currently see questions on the Q&A. But OK, so I was actually going to ask, uh, you might have mentioned this in your talk, especially in the last bit, but how does the CDR method compare to the zero noise extrapolation method or other existing error mitigation methods? Also, actually, uh, compared it to um, zero noise extrapolation for the case of um, deep uh, circuits, and large circuits, and at least in the case of our uh, implementation, we found that um, it produces better results for this um, very deep, well, for this deep and large circuit, at least deep and large, as long as our current devices are considered. For example, in the case of this QA result, which, we, um, which I've showed you, Earlier, we are attempting to also do zero noise extrapolation, but uh, we are unable to get significant improvement with our implementation of zero noise extrapolation. Um, any other questions from the panelists? Okay. 
Okay, with that, I want to thank you again, Peter, for a great talk. Um, thank you. We, I think we have a minute, but I, I guess it wouldn't hurt to start at the next talk. So the next talk is by Peter Cha from Cornell University, and his talk is titled Attention-Based Quantum Tomography. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Peter, feel free to just start your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um... So I guess I can um, start by sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay, um, can you see my screen and my mouse? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Great. <clears throat> All right, um, thank you, thank you everyone. Um, for coming, um, so my talk will be entitled will be uh, entitled "Attention Based Quantum Tomography," um, based on a work that was uh, uh, posted to the archive recently with this archive number. And uh, in this talk, I'll be uh, presenting a a new method of new uh, method of, of tomography based on um, neural network approach. Um, yeah, and this work was was done with my collaborator collaborators at at Cornell University, uh, Paul Ginsparg. Um, Felix Wu, who is in the computer science department, uh, Peter McMahon and Una Kim, as well as Juan Karaskia, who is at the Vector Institute and gave a very nice talk earlier, um, much of which uh, will be relevant to, to my talk as well. Uh, okay, so I thought I'd begin the talk by um, by describing the central problem that is uh, relevant to our work, which is the problem of quantum state tomography. Um, and basically, in, in order to start uh, to describe the problem, we'd like to I'd like to start with a quantum computer. Um, and so this is a picture of a, a quantum computer um, from IBM, and which is relevant to our work because in our work we'll, we'll eventually be be uh, we'll eventually use one of IBM's um, or I'll, I'll demonstrate how, how we work with one of IBM's publicly available quantum computers in our work. And so, so, and recently, like there's been a, a lot of, of progress in, in the manufacture and, and, and uh, usage of, of quantum devices with uh, large qubit sizes. And with this progress, like it has become the problem of, of verification and, and benchmarking these quantum devices, making sure that, that they really perform the way we want them to and, and measuring the error and noise inherent to these models has become a very important problem. And so the, the task of, 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 of estimating these errors by reconstructing the states um, in a classical way, uh, reconstructing the, the states that are realized on these quantum devices in a classical way is the task of tomography. And so in order to, to uh, begin, um, typically uh, a quantum, we'll begin with a quantum circuit um, over NQ qubits. And so the, the, the quantum device will be initialized to some state after which we execute some quantum quantum circuit that, that we're interested in that will hopefully give us target state that, that, that we are that is desired. But of course, um, quantum devices are subject to noise. And so wh whatever state is truly realized in the in the quantum device will not be the actual uh, target state, but it'll be the target state plus some noise. And this noise will, will can can come from various sources. But um, in general, it'll lead to a density matrix, which will not be the, which will not exactly be the, the state that we're interested in, but rather um, perhaps a mixed state um, that that um, with noise that 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 we won't know a, a priori. And so the task of tomography is to really is to um, write down this of uh, write down this density matrix, which can completely capture the state that is that is realized on the quantum device. And this process begins by um, taking a series of measurements, and so. Um, each one of these, the, each one of these classical measurements will be um, will collapse the the many body wave function of the quantum quantum device, which means that um, in order to get each one of these measurements, we'll have to um, initialize the state to the same state and then carry out the same um, quantum circuit before taking the measurements. Um, and so, um, and so I, I thought I'd, I'd like for the purposes of the rest of our discussion. I'd, um, I'd indicate like what kind of uh, measurements we're talking about here. And so um, in, in our work, we'll be using what's known as poly measurements or the poly PFEM, which is basically um, a form of measurement setting, which is uh, very easily accessible to uh, many different um, quantum devices. 
and it and it's effectively what it is 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 that before measuring um, the experimentalist will determine um, which axis um, which axis um, each qubit will be will be measured along. So for example, this first qubit will measure will be measured along the z axis. And in, and it turns out that the first qubit has a measure to be you know down in the z axis and this is, and say, the same with the second qubit but the third qubit it will be measured along the y axis and it has been found to be pointing down in, in the y direction and so on and so forth um, and so once the once we have this set of uh, measurements um, quantum tomography is the is a task of reconstructing the density matrix based on um, based on the the set of measurements that is available to the to um, to the person doing the tomography. So having stated the problem in, in a simple and succinct way, what is so difficult about this problem? Why is this problem so challenging? Well, as every as everyone um, might know, um, uh, a, an NQ qubit system, um, the, the state describing an NQ qubit um, many body quantum state typically lives in, an, in a Hilbert space whose uh, size is exponential in the, in the number of qubits. Um, and in particular, the density matrix that describes an NQ qubit many body system, uh, many body quantum state is going to involve uh, on the order of four to the NQ complex parameters. And so in order to give an indicate to, to give a sense of, of, of how quickly this, this grows, um, I thought I'd sort of walk through uh, some, some sample sizes, some, some like some example sizes of, of quantum systems. And so for a 10 qubit system, there are a million approximately on the order of a million parameters that will describe the density matrix. And so storing the density matrix will require about one megabyte of data, which is completely reasonable. Um, for a 20 qubit system, this will require 10 to the 12 parameters, which will require about one terabyte to store. And so this is feasible to store, but perhaps not very feasible to, to work with in practice. For a 53 qubit system, um, such as the one that was used, used in Google and is, is available to a few other um, state-of-the-art um, state-of-the-art art, uh, quantum devices um, describing the the density matrix of a 53 qubit system will involve 10 to the 30 parameters which will involve one quintillion terabytes of, of storage data which is um, beyond our capacity to either store or work with in any any reasonable way and so just as a comparison um, it, it has been estimated that all the information that is avail stored in the Library of Congress comes out to about 20 terabytes um, which is puts us somewhere between the 20 and the 53 qubit range. So this is one major reason. Um, well, this is the primary reason why um, why traditional methods of tomography, such as maximum likelihood estimation, um, while it works very well, um, it has been limited to to system sizes, small system sizes, such as less than 10 qubits, uh, because it quickly runs into into the scaling issue, um, where the number of parameters that it has to work with and the amount of data that it needs in order to work grows exponentially in the number of qubits. And so as you move forward in the era of larger and large, larger, um, larger system sizes and, and higher functioning quantum devices, the question becomes important. Um, is it possible to carry out tomography with reduced data and processing requirements? Um, perhaps, you know, of course, information theoretically, we cannot completely defeat the, the exponential bound. Um, but if we, but depending on, on the types of states that we're interested in, um, and the and the precision to which we're, we we we'd like to characterize these states, um, we might be able to do better than than maximum likelihood estimation. And so, um, one very exciting progress in the in, uh, in one very recent um, exciting recent progress has been made in this direction with um, it, it has been with generative models, um, generative machine learning models in particular. And so, the stage was set for um, the application of machine learning models. Um, generative models in, in uh, tomography with uh, restricted Boltzmann machines employed by Carlio et al. in 2017 and, and, uh, and some other works that have followed, um, in which they demonstrated the ability of, of RBMs to learn um, quantum states based on measurements. But of course, um, but due to, the, due to the limited expressibility of RBMs um, and the, uh, they, the, the RBMs were restricted to learning pure and positive states. And so um, given that we typically expect that the noise available in, in quantum devices will, um, will lead to states that are, are, are noisy and mixed states and, and, that, and that these errors are, are somewhat, are, are in some sense what we are after in tomography, um, it, it's, it definitely uh, further um, applying this approach to, to tomography that will definitely require uh, further, further work.
And so some progress was made in this direction by the introduction of um, uh, tomography approaches using recurrent neural networks or RNNs in Karaskia et al. in 2019. Um, where uh, RNNs, uh, where their approach using RNNs um, demonstrated that um, it may be possible to to reconstruct um, mixed density states, uh, density matrices using um, RNNs, but um, RNNs are, are inherently uh, restricted to to embodying short range correlations, um, which may not be be uh, well suited to the to the task of of tomography, where th that is targeting. Um, many body states that have long range entanglement or long range um, correlations um, since, uh, yeah, s since uh, the, those, the, those states may, may oftentimes be the mo ones of most interest. And so in this work, we'll be, um, we'll be developing um, a, a method of tomography based on the attention-based transformer, which is currently the state-of-the-art natural language processing architecture and so this raises, an, uh, this raises a question, the natural question of why would we expect um, an NLP architecture to be well suited to a, a to a to the tomography problem, and that's something that we'll talk about um, in this talk as we go on. And so, just as just before we go on, um, the the outline behind this talk will be um, will begin by giving some intuition behind um, attention based quantum tomography or AQT, including how the transformer works, um, why why it performs so well in NLP tasks, and why we expect it to work well in in tomography tasks. We'll, we'll then move on to, um, to our results in benchmarking AQT and, AQT and simulation versus other machine learning methods. Um, we'll also, uh, then we'll get to the, to the uh, meat, of, meat of our results, which is um, ex our experimental results um, demonstrating the success of AQT in, in tomography on IBM Q quantum, quantum devices. And then finally, we'll explore scalability with, with AQT. So we'll begin by, uh, by describing the, um, the function of the transformer in natural language processing. So the transformer is fundamentally a generative model that learns to write after reading. Um, and so in practice, the way this works is that the transformer will be trained on or it will read a set of sentences that has been given to it. The transformer will then learn the abstraction at the core of the language using a, a, um, a self-attention mechanism that has been shown to be highly efficient at, at picking up long range correlations. Um, present within sentences. And finally, um, once the, the transformer has learned the abstraction, it will then generate or write sentences that embody the abstraction and in some sense capture the correlations uh, in, that capture the correlations um, that were present in the data that was presented to it. And so the transformer has been shown to be uh, highly efficient in training and post-processing. And so in the original work where it was proposed in Baswani et al in 2017, um, the transformer was able to learn the English language based on a sample size of 2.2 million sentences, which can be, uh, which sounds like a lot, but in, but can be contrasted contrasted to the uh, total number of word combinations available in the English language, which might come out to about something like 10 to the uh, 100 and, uh, 10 to the 107. So certainly a much greatly reduced sample size, um, and of course. Um, the transformer is, is also able to sample li sample linearly in sentence length, which is uh, which is an amazing feat, given that the the transformer is sampling from a uh, from a, a, a space uh, of sentences that is exponential in the number of, in the sentence length. Um, yeah, and that feature will be important to us as well as we as we um, talk about how the transformer fits into the task of tomography. So in order to give some intuition behind the functioning of the transformer and, and, and how the self-attention um, how self-attention works and, and why why it we expect it to, to do so well in, in, in quantum systems, uh, we'll look at the sample problem of how the transformer learns um, English from, for example, the uh, list of English articles, the set of English articles from Wikipedia. And so suppose that we were to present the transformer with us with a set of uh, English articles from Wikipedia. Um, there, the the um, the the set that the transformer learns from will be will be will contain sentences such as this one. The transformer is a deep machine learning model. Dot dot dot. And so this is uh um so so this is the first sentence of of the uh, Wikipedia article on the transformer. And so the transformer will first pick up that there are seven learn seven words that are presented here, but perhaps five words that that need to be related to related to each other in some way. 
And so the transformer, as as it as it studies studies the set of sentences that have been given to it, will given to it, will pick up, for example, that the word the refers to the transformer. Um, in a similar way, it'll le learn that the word deep modifies machine learning, and also that these both of those words modify the word model. And um, the most uh, importantly, the transformer will pick up that the word model is in fact referring refers to the transformer even though there are many words in between those two. And so the transformer is able to learn how, how like the, 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 the benefit of, of having the self-attention um, drive the learning process of the transformer is that the transformer is able to learn um, how words that may be separated by, by many words in between are, are correlated with each other and how they give meaning to each other. And so having studied all of these sentences, the transformer is then able to, to reconstruct in some an abstract representation of of the uh, state of state of English as represented by Wikipedia, from the from which point the the transformer can can generate articles and generate sentences that um, follow the follow what what one might expect from Wikipedia. And so in, so it might start generating. It might be able to 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 generate um, Wikipedia articles based on some topic you ask for it. For example. So how does this apply to um, the task of tomography? Well, we can draw a simple parallel by um, comparing the, the set of um, the abstraction of Wikipedia as, as a representation of the English, English language with um, the quantum state that's, that is realized on a quantum computer, quantum device. And so in the same way, um, what is, what is, what is uh, shown to the transformer, what the transformer is trained on is going to be a set of sentences that are um, drawn, from the, drawn from the quantum device that in some sense embody the correlations that are present um, in, in, in the quantum state that is being realized in the quantum device. And so as the quantum, as a transformer and the self-attention mechanism studies the sentences that have been given to it, um, in the same way the, the transformer will learn the correlations that are present between, between the various quantum, uh, between the various qubits. And so for example, it learns that if, if the first, um, the, the, the first qubit is found to be in the down Z state, then, it, then that'll mean that the, the, second, um, the second spot will be in the down Z state with some probability and so on and so forth. And so having learned all of those correlations, since it, it is the case that correlations um, characterize the quantum state in some sense, um, the, the transformer is able to learn the quantum state that is being realized on, on the quantum computer that is producing these measurements and then from which point the transformer can be used to generate um, further, uh, can be used to reconstruct the density matrix. So how does the, the transformer fit into the overall structure of attention-based quantum tomography? Um, so once again, we begin with a quantum computer from which, as we've said, we, uh, we draw a, a, a number of measurements or measurement outcomes. And so we, we've, we take these measurement outcomes and, and train the transformer on, on these. And so um, the we'll feed it to the transformer, and then it'll go through a series of, of processing layers. For example, the embedding layer will embed the in incoming vector into a higher dimensional vector space, after which it goes through a number of self-attention layers, um, where each, within each layer there, there are multiple self-attention layers followed by a feed-forward layer, um, after, which, um, af after which the transformer will learn to assign a particular probability to the probability to, to the POVM measurement outcome. And so armed with the probability that is um, of, of the, all of the POVM um, outcomes, we will then be able to perform the POVM inversion that was, uh, which is a mathematical relation and was described in Juan's talk, Juan Karaskia's talk earlier, um, and, and thereby reconstruct the density matrix that describes the state of the original quantum computer that generated these outcomes in the first place. And so now we can move on to, to uh, some results. So we'll begin by, by showing by benchmarking AQT against um, prior um, prior machine learning approaches, and so in, in this problem we'll we'll get assign the problem the AQT the task of um, of of learning the GHG state, which is a state um, where um, where uh, where where the, the qubits are are in a super superposition of either being all up or 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 all down. And so we'll characterize the accuracy of, re of reconstruction by using the classical fidelity. Um, and the reason why we use the classical fidelity and not the exact quantum fidelity is because the exact quantum fidelity requires um, uh, reconstructing and manipulating the density matrix. And um, since we'll be lurking, working with extremely large system sizes, um, that will not be that will not be possible. 
And so, so what we will um, be studying is, uh, is for a given number of qubits n um, or n cube, uh, we'll, be we'll be finding the minimum number of samples necessary to achieve a classical fidelity of 0 0.99 and contrast RNN's performance against AQT. And so the plot is, as you can see here, um, this, in this, on this blue curve, you can see a prior result from using RNN to, to, to um, carry out state, quantum state reconstruction on the same state versus um, the, R, the AQT and where the y-axis is, is in log plot uh, representing the number of states, that, uh, number of samples that are necessary to achieve this classical fidelity. And so the, the takeaway is that the AQT um, requires a, about an almost an order of magnitude uh, less data than, than is required by the RNN to achieve the same, same um, fidelity um, showing that the um, AQT achieves much, much more efficient learning um, than, than pre previous other machine learning approaches. So next we'll, we'll move on to the, to the question of reconstructing mixed states with AQT still in simulation. And so in order to test this, uh, we'll, um, we'll try uh, asking the AQT to reconstruct, um, to detect a faulty qubit. Um, so we'll, we've come up with a simple um, faulty qubit model where we're still studying the, the three qubit GHC, GHC state, but um, the first qubit has a prob probability P of being flipped between zero and one. And so um, since we are working with a restricted number of qubits, we can we actually can ca calculate the exact quantum fidelity using this formula here. Um, but in short, if, if, we, if this is the actual realized state in some sense, and we are comparing this against the um, the idealized target state of the G pure GHC state, then we'll find that the quantum fidelity should vary with P like one minus P. And so, so this is the one minus P is the behavior that we would expect to see. And, and this is also the way that we could use the, the determined quantum fidelity to estimate P after, um, if, if we do not know, know P uh, a priori. And so this is the plot that, that um, of, of, the, uh, of the calculated computed um, quantum fidelity. Of, of the um, state that is reconstructed by the transformer. And so you'll see that, um, so, so you'll see that, that the, uh, the uh, AQT is able to reproduce the uh, quantum fidelity as we would expect. Um, the, the behavior is, is, approximate, is linear and, and approximates the, um, the, the line that we would expect to see one minus P to a good accuracy showing that the um, AQT is able to, to give a good estimation of the probability P if it is not um, without a priori knowing what the probability is. So finally, we can move on to the um, to the uh, experimental results where we will be carrying out um, IBM Q state reconstruction. And so, uh, for this method, for this pro problem, we we are once again studying the three qubit GHC state um, whose density matrix will look like this: uh, zero point five in uh, in in all corners and with all other elements zero in the pure state. And we'll be um, we'll be um, uh, using uh, 2,700 samples um, for this reconstruction. And the reason why we've restrict restricted ourselves to three qubits is because um, we wanted to compare, we wanted to benchmark AQT against um, maximum likelihood estimation, which is um, which is the tomography method that is offered by IBM Q. Um, and it turned out that um, on the at least at least with the with the uh, public um, public access. Um, IBM Q machines, um, three qubits was the maximum number of, of, of qubits that we were allowed to, to do tomography with. And so that's, that's, that's why we are testing this with, with three qubits. And so this is, the, um, this is a graphical representation of the density matrix um, where, where each, each uh, column represents a, a, uh, the absolute value of the density matrix element. Um, and so, so and so, in an idealized GHC state, we would have seen that each of these, each of the four corners would have had, had a height of 0 0.5, while all the other elements were zero. Um, but um, due to noise and, and other other sources of error, um, we can see that the that the reconstructed density matrix does not quite achieve the exact um, fidelity. It does not achieve the exact density matrix. Rather, we can compare this against the um, the, the reconstructed quantum state with uh, that is provided by the maximum likelihood estimation method um, that was provided in IBM Q's soft, IBM software package. And we can see that the, the two are in good agreement so that AQT is able to reconstruct um, density matrices density matrices from experimental, um, experimental data 
um, in good agreement with um, existing sort of um, ex ex existing uh, tomographic method tomographic methods that have been uh, verified to be to, to work. Sorry, Peter. Around two more minutes. Okay. Um, so, so finally, we, we'll we'll just brief uh, we'll discuss briefly the scalability of AQT. And so, for this task, we'll be we, we uh, studied the six qubit GHC state with two hundred thousand samples. And so, this is in simulation for, for the for the reason for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, because we could not benchmark um, benchmark um, against the uh, IBM Q's uh, innate um, IBM Q's native tomographic method. And so. Uh, Plotting the density matrix in the same way as before, we find a density matrix that, that looks something like this. Um, we would have expected um, the the results to be to reach 0 0.5 on all corners and zero everywhere else. Um, there there is still we're working with a finite number of, of of samples, which is why we still have errors. But we see that the result is in good agreement with with what we would expect uh, with with what we would like to see. So in conclusion, um, we've demonstrated in this work that the AQT represents a significant enhancement in sample complexity of reconstruction uh, compared to previous machine learning approaches requiring much less um, sample size for to achieve the same um, same level of fidelity. Next, we've also re uh, demonstrated um, that the AQT is capable of, of re reconstructing mixed state density matrices in our simple faulty qubit model. Finally, we've demonstrated that the AQT is the first machine learning technique um, to reconstruct the density matrix of, a, of, of using the data from a real quantum computer um, on, on a level uh, comparable to, um, uh, to, to what is available uh, with, uh, with pre-existing um, methods such as maximum likelihood estimation. And so for future, future directions, um, there are uh, many directions. Um, in this, in this uh, work, we've primarily focused around the uh, study the GHC state, but of course, um, one can wonder uh, how it performs on states with more complex entanglement and more complex structures. Um, we can also ask, um, uh, work with larger number of qubits, especially in, in an experimental setting. Um, and also, of course, we could um, think, think about more sophisticated error models um, that more accurately reflect uh, the types of noise that are present in a, in a real quantum device. Um, and so with that, um, thank you for your attention. So uh, we, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks Peter for a great presentation. I think we have one question from Vladimir. So why do you have a fidelity value of larger than one when you present the results about the faulty qubits? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so, yeah, here, I think this is it. Yes. So the reason why we have a fidelity value of greater than one is because it's, it's kind of related to to um, to, to our uh, our POVM inversion method. The the if the probability di distribution that we were reconstructing was exact, um, then we would we would then the density mat matrix we reconstruct would um, would satisfy all of the standard things like positive definite Hermitian things, um, her her Hermitianness and and whatnot. But because because our our um, probability reconstruction is not exact, um, the density matrix density matrix that we have is is not strictly speaking is not completely positive definite. It does have some negative eigenvalues, and that's kind of where the the um, quantum fidelity greater than one is coming from. But we expect that with increasing sample sizes and better reconstruction of the probability, that the negative eigenvalues would would also go to zero as well. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to all the other speakers from session eleven.